welcome to Energy Talks, a regular podcast series with expert discussions on power system testing topics. My name is Stefan Achberger from the podcast team at Omicron, and I will be your host. Hello, everyone. This is the third episode of our mini-series called Circuit Breaker Testing Around the World. We want to have expert discussions about what circuit breaker technologies are used, how circuit breakers are tested, and the reasons for these differences all over the world. In this episode, I have the honor of talking to Florian Predel and Tibor Congo from Australia. They both have many years of experience in power system testing and are talking to me today from our Omicron office in Melbourne. So welcome to our third episode of circuit breaker testing around the world. I'm excited to have two people from across the world uh, with me right now from Australia. So hello, Flo and Tibor. Uh, good of you to take the time to have this conversation. Hello, Stefan. Hello, Stefan. Nice to be here. Awesome. I'm looking forward to it. So first of all, as usual, give me just a short introduction of yourselves. So what's your background? What are you doing right now? And why are you part of, of this conversation today? Yeah, my name is Florian. Um, at Omicron, I am in the technical support team. So I look after yeah, technical support inquiries uh, from our users here in Australia, New Zealand and Pacific Islands. Yeah. Awesome. Tibor? So I'm working as a sales and application engineer for Omicron in Australia, looking after users in Queensland and New Zealand. So how much experience do you both have in, in circuit breaker testing? Is it many years or, or is it just in, in the last couple of years? So how would you describe your experience levels? I would say maybe low to medium. My experience with Circuit Breaker started when Omicron launched the Circuit Breaker test set we have. So I was basically the one been traveling around the country and showing it to our customer base here to like on-site demonstrations or basically use it in product trainings on-site. So I've been exposed a little bit to yeah, Circuit Breaker testing in the field and saw a couple of different uh, breaker types and some special ones. So I would say, but still no expert. Awesome. Tibor, how about you? In terms of testing, it's been sort of ramped up in my time during here with Omicron. So doing some training sessions, also doing some support, technical support for people who are just using the test set, or maybe they've got some results that they need a hand interpreting. Other than that, previously to Omicron, I had maybe 10 years in the industry, consulting, transmission, distribution, mining. Um, where I sort of interface with circuit breaker specifications and sort of reacting to some funny results, but really getting in depth has been for the last three years with Omicron. Awesome. Well, cool to have you both here and to answer me some, some questions. Let's start in getting into the business. So I've never been to Australia. So tell me in a nutshell, what makes Australia specific or unique, uh, especially in regards to the, to the electrical grid. So I assume it's all very tall over, um, on your side of the world, but I have never been there. So please, for anybody that hasn't been to Australia, what makes, what makes it unique in, in regards to the electrical grid? The unique features of our grid, when I consider sort of other regions, would probably be that we have relatively low population density, meaning that we end up with very long sort of distribution and transmission lines and basically just like a wide distribution of assets. Yeah, and in terms of yeah, circuit breaker types, I think, yeah, Stefan, you do a lot of circuit breaker tests. You would enjoy it here because it's not <laughs> like all types. It's like you see quite a different variety of breaker types. I was listening to the podcast from our colleague, uh, Chuck, and he was talking mainly about dead tank breakers. Being in America, uh, Europe mostly live tank, but here you have quite a healthy mix, I would say, of dead tank, live tank, SF6 type, minimum oil breakers, bulk oil breakers. So it's quite a variety of different breaker types. Do you have any idea why that came to be and, and why other parts of the world have focused on, on one specific type and you guys seem to just kind of use whatever fits best wherever it fits best? I'm not sure where that set that up. I guess we have quite a few different utilities looking after networks. We do have also a different appetite for trying new things. So one thing that comes to mind is, I guess, when I was working in Queensland for the transmission company, what we found there was that these circuit breakers, past circuit breakers were developed in uh, Sweden, Switzerland for use in Queensland. And they were, had some sort of intelligent sensor components in them. 
But when they brought them to the Australian outback, they found that after 10, 15 years, they were having quite a few failures. Sort of local mitigation, where we actually took some um, mud guards from trucks, effectively, to make a cover for some of the electronic components, just to deal with the heat uh, of the Australian okay. outback. So that's maybe something that's like a little bit unique to our part of the world in how we have to apply this technology. Very interesting. So you brought or got general breakers from Europe and you had to cover mud breaks to just put some shade on, uh, above them in a way. Is that, did I understand yeah, that correctly? They just needed like a big half cylinder. So I think something that they could find off the shelf without having to make something yeah. customized was, yeah, they just found like some tire guards that from the truck that they could fit on top and make a little roof. Interesting. So you, you, you're building roofs for your circuit breakers in Australia. I guess that's, that's very that's unique in that way. The skier, which had some sort of intelligent sensors, some electronics that yeah. were really struggling in the extreme heat. That's a fun little fact. So what, what do you see the trend going? So if you look back to the older breakers in Australia, what types were used uh, historically? Where's the trend going? So newer substations, what are you using in, in medium voltage and high voltage stations? Yeah, medium voltage in the past was like oil, basically, as a interrupting medium. Some of yeah. those breakers still in use, especially like in the bigger populated cities like Melbourne and Sydney. We have the underground uh, substations under the buildings and you find some really old gear <laughs> still in use. It still works fine because I think back in those days, they just over dimensioned everything. So the insulations level was like, I don't know, three times what they're supposed <laughs> to insulate. So they're still running fine. But these days, I think it's mostly vacuum breaker you find in the medium voltage application. And, I think they are also trialing it in higher voltage levels as well, or entering the higher voltage levels yeah. as well with vacuum chambers, especially nowadays, also in high voltage, there's a lot of SF6, but SF6 being a greenhouse gas, not that good <laughs> anymore. <laughs> um, so yeah, we find also there a bit of a trend, I would say, towards vacuum breakers. And for uh, extra high voltage, it's still mostly then live tank or dead tank, or is it really a new substations? Could be anything. Can be a mix, really. I remember when I was working for the transmission company in Queensland, I was just talking to Flo about that. Basically, uh, we had two different specifications, one for live tank, one for dead tank. And depending on the X and R ratio, we would choose one or the other. So the preference okay. would be for the dead tank because protection designers preferred this. Uh, they didn't mm -hmm. have any dead zones. They they could have an overlap, but otherwise, yeah. Could you explain really... that a little bit? What you what you meant? Uh, you said the XR ratio. So it's basically just uh, how much space you have available, or if you could just explain that uh, real quick. No, sorry. So that's the reactants, the inductive reactants divided by the resistance okay. of the circuit that's been protected. So that's going to determine the amount of DC offset you might expect during operation. Interesting. On, on, and on that base, you choose what kind of circuit breaker or what's the kind of circuit breaker type you're, you're using in that situation. Yeah. So basically, the big transmission companies are going to have a period contract with suppliers, typically five years plus. And then what they ended up with was two specifications, one which is the dead tank, which has some limitations that they would use everywhere they can. But if they, if they didn't, like if it was outside the specification of this breaker, then they would go with the live tank. That's very interesting. It's fascinating that other parts of the world are just using one type and kind of don't even, are not even, I've never in my life seen a dead tank circuit breaker. Like it's just not a thing in Europe. In America, it's kind of the other way around. You just don't have any live tanks and you guys just, well, depends on the situation, what, uh, what I need right now. And then you'll, you'll choose accordingly. It's kind of, kind of okay. fascinating. But it seems like the, the perfect playground for, for a circuit breaker testing engineer to go to Australia and get to know all the, all the breakers. What are like the, because Flo, you said earlier that there's some, some really old gear in uh, underneath the buildings in, in the cities. So what's like the oldest gears you've seen that is, that are still in use? Ooh, uh, definitely before we were born. So <laughs> 50s, 60s, even before the moon landing, I would say. <laughs> Crazy. <laughs> Yeah, I always think of the, the Netherlands where it, we had some similar conversations and it's fascinating. There's like literally stuff still from the 40s still in use. But as you say, it was back then it was just built to last and well, it still it still lasts to this day. But it's just to look at it, it's like from a different time. Well, it is from a different time. 
Let's go a little bit into the to the testing. So if you go, let's say, start with the, the basic testing, you have just a limited amount of time for, for your circuit breaker testing. What kind of tests do you perform? What is like the, the bread and butter of, of circuit breaker testing in, in Australia? Yeah, that would depend a bit on what uh, breaker type we are talking about and whether it's yeah, medium voltage or high voltage or extra high voltage uh, breaker. Let's say medium voltage breaker, think typically timing measurement and contact resistance measurements are being mm -hmm. performed. Depending on insulation medium, maybe an IR test. And I mean, definitely a visual inspection as well. And for high voltage breakers with arcing contacts, I think nowadays people do dynamic resistance measurements because that kind of combines a timing test as well and can also be combined with a motion measurement contact travel measurement as well kind of like, like the dynamic resistance measurement is i would say like one test combining many individual tests because it also gives you the coil current characteristic of the triple closed coil plus the arcing contact resistance arcing contact length if you combine it with a motion a measurement and, and the timing so similar to Germany, where we also had the same conversation where we said, yeah, back in time, it used to be timing and, and contact resistance. And today it kind of can do a lot of things with just the same setup, but just doing a, a, contact, a dynamic contact resistance test instead. But this is dynamic contact resistance tests. I assume you can only do on the life tank breakers, right? So is, is there a different type of test that you perform on the death tanks? Dead tanks, we have done a dynamic resistance measurement as well, but it only works if you, if you have basically a gap between the bushing and the CTs mounted. Because what you can then do is you can wire your current test leads under the CTs on top. So there is basically no DC current through the CTs, basically, which are mounted there. So in those cases, you can do it. Otherwise, it's not possible yeah, because you have that inductive behavior of the CT as part of the measurement. Just that simple idea is, is fascinating to me from never having tested a death tank circuit breaker that you can just go with the wires through the CTs and kind of just say, I'm testing you like a life tank circuit breaker and I don't care what we are. It seems funny to me. I'm not sure of unique here, but so far for the death tank breakers I've seen, they had this gap available. So. In most breakers, this is actually available and, and possible to do in that case. Very interesting. Yeah. This makes someone wants to, every circuit breaker engineer is going to want to to travel to Australia now just to try all the all the different things. So that is the one thing. Even in in death tank circuit breakers, you do the dynamic contact resistance, which I've not heard so far. Um, anything else that is kind of more uh, specific or or any type of test where you're like, this is when I and I have more time and I really want to get the overall view. Anything that is that you perform additionally to the dynamic contact resistance test, which are already kind of advanced by themselves. I, I think, think for a while people have been doing the minimum pickup test. That that's okay. something that's like regulated in the standards, so they want to make sure they do it. When I talk to people who are not exposed to Sibano yet, and then I make a joke and I tell them like, okay, I guess some people, they have a variac and then they turn it on and off on a switch and then they sort of adjust the voltage again, turn it on and off. And they're kind of like, oh, I wish you wouldn't laugh so much because that's how we do it. <laughs> <laughs> um, explain to them that it's really nice if you can control the pulse that you apply in magnitude and time and then have that controlled uh, rest period as well. So I think people are very keen to do this test with a little bit more control and repeatability then that's available. And then the other one that I am seeing growing in popularity massively is the first trip test. So I have some personal experience in this. When I worked at the uh, distribution utility in New Zealand, the, the meter company, they uploaded like a an update to the firmware to all the meters that we didn't know about because we were wirelessly connected. And at the same time, there was a guy building a fence down the uh, down the road somewhere, and he hit one of our cables. And again, another coincidence, one our circuit breakers, which were relatively new vacuum technology circuit breakers at the substation, they had slightly over 200 millisecond operating time after they've been sitting there for a year or so. So most people's circuit breaker fail is set to 200 milliseconds, but this was operating maybe after 220 milliseconds. So basically we lost the bus, uh, 1,600 customers were turned off. And because of this meter upgrade that also happened that we didn't know about, 
uh, we had 1,600 calls from the community saying, hey, we have no hot water because when the power was turned back on, the meter upgrade didn't turn the water on in response to the ripple signal. So we very quickly learned the value of a first trip test. We want to share the story. Other people also see the value of um, including this in their maintenance. Very interesting. Yeah, personally in Europe, it's less of a thing, even though I also feel like a trend that it's, it's coming more and more just because you can now with, with modern test devices do it pretty, pretty easily. But I've never heard an example where it's really, if we would have only done that test before, then we wouldn't have run in, into those types of issues. So you're saying minimum pickup test, first trip test are, are kind of on the rise and, and coming more. Maybe if you if you dare looking into the future a little bit, how do you see where do you see circuit breaker testing going? Um, do you have any ideas of of what will, what this discussion would look like maybe in ten years? Are we just gonna collect via Bluetooth to our breaker and it's gonna tell us how it feels, or what's your what's your outlook there? I think that's supposed to be the plan. Yeah, I mean, looking into the future, but also has I think increased a little bit in popularity is like online testing of breakers like what we do with the medium voltage breakers using those uh, VDS, the voltage indicators for timing mm -hmm. measurements. So that has gained some popularity. Yeah, basically all kinds of measurements which can be done while the circuit is live and we don't have to take it offline and have it out of service for a while. It costs money. So many monitoring we can do online is, is even better. I've definitely yeah. come across a couple of utilities that are now doing this application where they use functions that are already available in the IED that's connected to the circuit breaker because it's interfacing with its um, trip and close circuits, but it also has 52 AB contacts coming back in. So you can already do a little bit of a trending in regards to the timing of when those signals are sent and when the feedback's received. Interesting. I mean, do you have the risk there that if something is wrong with the main contact that you wouldn't see it, but at least you can get, as you correctly said, like a trending of where the general circuit breaker time is going? We monitoring in a way, I guess, because the capability is already there, the circuitry is already connected, and it just <clears> to, <throat> requires the engineers of the utilities to make the programming to make sure that they're capturing that data. Yeah. I mean, again, like for monitoring, it, it seems a little bit, uh, I wouldn't trust it too much since you don't have any information about the main contact. So you could literally, they could fall off and you wouldn't see it in the auxiliary contact, but at least to, to give you yeah, kind of a feeling about the general, at least of the, the operating mechanism, how fast that is, is going to be. It's super basic, but yeah. I think if I look ahead, really like the, the world is moving towards like a big data and making the most of all the data yeah. that we have available to us and analyzing that to assess the condition of our assets. Awesome. So if somebody has no experience yet in circuit breaker testing and maybe their company wants to start circuit breaker testing and they're choosing, how do you, how do you start with that if you, if you don't have any experience uh, beforehand? I think first of all, it would be good to get an overview of the circuit breaker population in use and maybe do some research on most common failure causes and failure patterns for the breaker. So you can maybe focus your testing on that point or that component, which statistically fails most often on that breaker type. And then, yeah, focus on that kind of measurements. Yeah, if it's, for example, the operating mechanism, maybe a motion measurement does make more sense or timing measurement. If there's problems with the coils and coil current characteristic measurement, a minimum pickup test, these kind of tests makes more sense in that case. I think I've pointed a lot of people to the resources that we already have available. So we have quite a lot of videos on the YouTube channel for Omicron Energy. And Stefan, you have a very nice video as well. So I've pointed a few people <laughs> out and get some good insights from this. There's also stuff on our recorded webinars. There's trainings that we offer in the Omicron offices, which I think are really worthwhile. But I think at the end of the day, you really can't be going out there, connecting to the assets, making the measurements and really analyzing them, like try to look at what's coming out in terms of the measurements and just try to make sure that you can really understand all the characteristics that are being measured. Don't just collect uh, the results uh, and look at whether you get a green tick or red cross in your automatic assessment. If the software does that, as to be as Tibo mentioned, understand uh, the results, what do they mean? How does a good result look like? How does a, let's say, not so good result look like? 
Interestingly, that just reminded me of, of playing online chess, where afterwards you don't just, yeah, I lost or I won, but you can analyze it and the computer tells you where you blundered, etc. So, yeah, but thanks also for, for the hint with, with all the trainings that we have available, the webinars and the, the videos on YouTube. So I guess if anybody around the world, wherever they are, is interested in circuit breaker testing, Omicron is, is there to support. Let's, let's slowly wrap this up. Um, regards to circuit breaker testing, anything that we've missed out on, anything that you wanted to, to tell us about the Australian circuit breakers that we haven't talked about yet and you would just like to get out in the open? Well, there's also some more advanced tests, uh, some utilities too, like, for example, partial discharge measurements. Uh, some utilities do that on the medium voltage breakers, like um, not on the vacuum bottle itself, but uh, the whole structure, the uh, insulators in the structure around it. Tibor recently showed me a case, one of uh, one user basically did the PD measurement and they found some surface tracking basically on the holder for the for the vacuum bottles. So you see some nice Lichtenberg figures, yeah, yeah the tree structures. And then yeah, it's also a popular test uh, for like high voltage GIS um, breakers or switch gear in general, either with built-in antennas or those bolt on antennas you can put on the spaces between the compartments where you basically pick up signals in the ultra high frequency range. See, maybe if I can jump in there, you mentioned GAS. That's actually something I wanted to ask earlier. So you have life tank, you have death tank. How much GAS? Is that also a trend becoming more and more like it seems in the rest of the world? Or do you have enough space in, in Australia that you don't really need GAS as much? Yeah, we have a lot of space, but <laughs> cities are still very densely populated. So we, we do have GIS and I think it's, I'm not sure if it's coming more and more, but I think most major cities here in Australia, they have GIS in use down to, I think, 66 KV and then upwards to higher voltage levels. Okay. Yes. Yeah, just... In New Zealand, there's a couple of sites where the 220 KV GIS um, is in use. Okay, but in general, you would say it's still quite quite rare to have GAS for the most part, unless in, in really in very densely populated Not cities. Popular. Yeah, let's say rare compared to like a populated city in Europe, yes. Okay. Any last words about circuit breaker testing from you, Tibor? When I was thinking about this interview, something came to mind that was quite interesting. In the last few months that came as a support case was a user sent me through a um, core characteristic that they couldn't evaluate. And when I looked at it, it just looked like a bunch of high frequency pulses. So maybe this is related to what we're going to see in the future. But there's more and more of these electronic coils coming up in circuit breakers, I guess, rather than the old yeah. um, electromagnetics. I've seen that trend in, in Europe as well, and it doesn't really make it easier to, to analyze the coils, right? Have you have gotten any experience yet on, on how those newer types of coils can be interpreted or, or how did you do that in, in, in your case? It was okay, actually, because we managed to get some response from the manufacturer. It did take about a month, <laughs> but they did come back and they told us the frequency of the pulses that we should expect, how often we should expect those bunches of pulses to repeat, and also the peaks. Awesome. I have, have not had that experience yet when, when those types of, of coils, but that's really cool to, to see that manufacturers are also yeah, responding and, and kind of helping out in that way. The famous last question that I usually have, especially in, in Europe, we have the words energy crisis thrown around quite a lot. I'm just interested in, in a different part of the world. How do you see the, the resilience of your energy grid? And do you feel anything of the energy crisis or are you afraid of what's coming? Or do you feel like your grid is quite resilient and you're, you're ready for any challenges ahead? Basically, I think we are also missing the system inertia that's been felt around the world. So it's, it's, you know, leading into research on some technologies like implementing a lot more synchronous condensers and also working on the configuration of the inverters that are connected to the grid. I have also noticed that, yeah, at least in the transmission company I used to work at, now they're heavily investing in point and wave switching. So that's not going on all of their power transformers and some of the big lines to reduce charging currents. So there's definitely some trends there. I think that that's it for me. Thank you both very much. It was a, a very interesting insight into into the world of circuit breakers in Australia. Some things I've never heard of and and yeah, didn't really expect. But it's it's cool that you have such a wider range of of circuit breaker types and you can really play around with with all of them. So thank you both for taking the time for this conversation. Awesome, Stefan. Thank you. Thank you, Stefan. We hope you enjoyed our conversation and we want to thank you for listening to this episode of Energy Talks. 
We always welcome your questions and feedback. Simply send us an email to podcast at omicronenergy.com. Omicron has several years of experience in power system testing and offers you the matching solutions for your application. This includes devices for testing circuit breakers, which are the topic of this conversation. For more information, be sure to visit our website at omicronenergy.com and please join us to listen to the next episode of Energy Talks. Goodbye for now, everyone. Thank you.